Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 96, recorded the 6th of June 2011. In the show, we talk about cat copters. Indiana Harris, not Jones, joins us. IPv6 Nest South Africa ready. And 3D printed art. It's awesome. I hope you enjoy the show. <coughs> Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 96. Uh, in the show this week, we have Jan Vermeulen. Hi there. Indiana Harris. Hi there. Almost said Jones. Uh, <laughs> you all done for not. Karen Pimela. Hello, hello. Um, and myself, Tim Hawk. Uh, our random for this week is a XKCD uh, com comic, and we got it by clicking the random on the comic on XKCD site. We're so creative. Yes, <laughs> very. And the number is six seven six, and it ran it up, landing up being quite awesome. Um, an X64 processor is screaming along at billions of cycles per second to run the X new kernel, which is frantically working through all the POSIX specified abstraction to create the Darwin system underlying OS X, which in turn is straining itself to run Firefox and Xgecko renderer, which creates a flash object which renders dozens of video frames per every second. Because I wanted to see a cat jump into a box and fall over, I am God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, XKCD. Yes, that's right. Uh, and if you ever come across XKCD, please go check it out. It's so so awesome. Uh, events happening: uh, Humble Indie Bundle number five is out the fifth of June. Some awesome awesome it's games until, until the fifteenth of June. And it, and it is awesome. Like if you haven't bought a Humble Indie Bundle yet, this is the one to buy. Except it doesn't have Android support, but it's not an Android bundle. But to give you a rundown, we have Amnesia, Limbo. Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery, Psychonauts, and if you pay over the uh, average, you get Bastion, which is awesome. Yeah. Psychonauts was fantastic. Bastion is fantastic. I haven't played any of the others. Um, just I know yet. the Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery is apparently one of the top ranking iPad games. Yes. Supposed to be doing very well. Amnesia is supposed to make you kind of wet yourself. Uh, in, in the words of some random Reddit user, finally everybody who buys Humble Indie Bundles will know what pants. <laughs> we'll cut that out. <clears throat> uh, uh, in the words of some random Reddit user, um, everybody will finally understand what pants wedding horror is like. So that's Amnesia cool. in a nutshell. And Psychonauts is just absolutely awesome. If you've never played it, uh, you actually mentioned earlier that you enjoy the, the puzzle games. Fantasy puzzle. Uh, this is definitely cool. it's quite a puzzle, but with a bit of action. Um, so you've got to work out where all the different things on and chat to people. But plus, you, you've got to work. Uh, it's just it's awesome. It is uh, mm. double fine productions. One of the best games actually out there. Very very cool. I might even give it a bash. Yes, yeah, and I'll some of the awesome know. things about the Humbellini bundle: uh, DRM free games, pay what you want, um, and three platforms. Yeah. Three platforms: Linux, Mac. And Windows, uh, Windows, that other one, that other one, and yeah. they're giving the music as well. So you get uh, the the albums, the music that they use in the games as well. And the Bastion soundtrack, I can tell you, is awesome. Yeah, in fact, all these games have pretty well-renowned soundtracks. So, as I said, if you're buying a humble indie bundle, this is the one to get. And then, and, and it has an awesome name. Yes. <laughs> as well. Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, some other things. Sixth uh, of June, which is today, is World IPv6 Launch Day. Uh, once again, it's just basically trying to get people to start migrating. Uh, we're going to talk a bit, bit about it a bit more later in the show in South Africa. Cool. Uh, Ray Bradbury, unfortunately, has died. Uh, he's quite a well-known uh, science fiction writer. Uh, Bradbury Theatre is one I was thinking of. We used to be on TV. Uh, Fahrenheit 451. Um, it's a whole bunch of, of science fiction books he's written. Uh, one, Jan, Windows Azure. Yes, so uh, there's a Windows Azure event happening tomorrow. And uh, you can register if you want to see the, the live stream at meet, I think meetwindowsazero.com. Um, if, if you're a South African Microsoft developer that's been interested in this and you've been wondering where South African support is, keep your eyes peeled. There will be something interesting happening hopefully tonight. Um, so um, I'll be covering it as best as I possibly can, considering that I'm only going to be leaving the show very late. Um, but yes, there's this. Uh, I've been given a heads up on some interesting, interesting things coming there. Very cool. Uh, Rage is coming, as always. That's all we're going <laughs> like to say. Winter. Uh, and we did say we were going to mention it every week. Yes. So we're still mentioning <laughs> it. Definitely well worthwhile. Yeah. And the reason we're mentioning it is for the LAN, not necessarily for the show. Even though the show yeah. is fine, the problem is it's the LAN tickets. If you're interested in that massive thousand-man LAN they run every year, those tickets sell out in two hours. That's why we mention it every week. So. Yes. You want tickets? Start, Start getting ready for with it now. Your clicking. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, Samsung Galaxy S3 official launch tomorrow. We yeah. should be able to get it. Yeah, because yeah, you have been able to get it on at Vodacom World yes. specifically. So tomorrow we'll find out um, uh, which other operators are going to be offering the device. MTN already is. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so tomorrow we'll see what happens with the rest. I must say, I've looked at this quite a nice phone. My, my main reason I'm actually going to be getting myself one of these is battery life. Good battery life, yeah. And a couple of other things that aren't, the others are better, yeah. but for me, battery Removable life Removable battery, what I, I really love the HTC One X's design, but the S3 has little features like it's got eye tracking. So if you're lying in bed, which I've, oh. I've ended up doing like a couple of times now with the One X, and, I, and I'm like, I wish this thing had eye tracking like the S3, because I'm watching a TED video or something, and then the screen rotates the wrong way. What I want is the lock like Apple has. You can, well, the HTC One X has a lock, you just, but you have to, you can't like double tap on a button and then enable the lock. You have to, mine's a widget on a home screen. So I can't, I have to first exit my TED app, it's go and lock the screen. It's a fail. Yeah, I don't like it. I, I want the little button. Indeed. Um, Nokia Lumia 9 la 900 launch. Yep, so that's happening. We got the invitation today. So breaking news, everyone. Um, uh, we knew that it was coming to South Africa. They're having a launch event. That doesn't mean that that's when the device is going to be available. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be, they, they said, I think, at the end of this month, the device will be available. But the launch event is going to be on the 19th of June. Cool. Um, and then something I know nothing about, exclusives, stickers launch. Yes, I don't know anything about this either. Exclusives have, has been teasing this. This is something that I'm interested in attending, if time permitting. Um, they are talking about some kind of online digital book store that's going to be different from everything else out there and a social experience and blah, blah, blah. It sounds like your bog standard PR spiel, but it could be interesting. So um, I know exclusives, this is exclusive books. Um, they have been uh, selling ebooks, yeah. uh, ePubs, on their website for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, maybe so they're revamping that. Maybe an upgrade or something. Well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they offer. Um, if, if what they offer is an, an, an e-book that's actually cheaper than a paper book, I'm there. Yeah. Mm, yeah, totally. I mean, because right now we're paying as much for e-books as we are. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Well, look, mm. I, I know I finally have migrated over to Kindle. Kindle, yes. And I'm, I'm not buying any more paper books. <laughs> yeah. There's just no point. Yeah. It just works Yeah, I'm, well. I'm, I'm busy getting angry with um, some, some publisher over Audible books which are suddenly not available in South Africa. But also, I mean, so, on, on, on the same note, I know I heard um, from Dion Chang, he's actually bought out, I mean, he does his Flux Trends, mm. and he normally, I know he's bought out two books that came out in paperback, but he's recently just launched um, Flux Trends, I don't know which one it is, but it's, it's all got to do with um, trends and how South Africa is changing and different people, but he has solely bought out his book in ebook. He's not bringing it out in paperback. Well, so it works be better be because yeah. um, I must say I'm, I'm actually buying far more books now, mm. um, which is bad. Well, also now they're bad and good. Yes. You're reading them. Yes. So actually, you're reading I'm, more. I'm reading way more. Yes. And that's what I also find I'm starting to read a lot of the older books as well. Um, you know, like, I mean, okay, like Moby Dick is a stupid example. Like, Dracula. You know, yeah, exactly. Like those old school ones that you just wouldn't really pick up in, in a bookshop to yeah. buy. You'd buy, you know, the newest things. Or, but I'm starting to find I'm collecting online, you know, like editions of, of older books. and. Mm. This is very cool. Something else I just remember that I wanted to add. Apparently, Park Station for the car train for our Johannesburg and Centurion listeners is apparently <laughs> going to be open tomorrow. Let's get into our topics. Uh, first topic is IPv6 is SA ready. Yeah, so uh, I, I did, chatted with uh, Neology's network engineer, yeah. or one of the network engineers at Neology, Graham Bianica. Um, he's also co chair of the uh, ISPA working group. ISPA uh, Internet Service Providers Association. And um, so sort of two hats on there, mm -hmm. but um, it was interesting speaking with him on the topic nonetheless. So uh, on the one hand, he punted their, their products. Uh, Neology has a set of, of products to bridge IPv4 and v6. They, they use um, 6RD, uh, rapid deployment, okay. uh, rather than 6 to 4 technology. Um, and, uh, and that's apparently what my broadband uses right now. Um, they've actually used are you guys IPv6 compliant? Uh, but using Neology stuff because uh, it's not native at Hetzner. Uh, yeah, so you're basically going to be running a tunnel through to them. Yes. Um, and then from there, they providing the IPv6. That sounds like what's going on, yeah. So I know with all of these, you can, if you want to test it now, you can just run a, there's a whole bunch, just look it up, tunnel IPv6, yeah, you yeah. can get an IP and play yourself playing with it. Okay, cool, cool, yeah. And, and um, in, in the article, I also link to, uh, or he, he, sort of linked to a site 
um, saying, hey, here you can test whether your connection is IPv6 compliant. So um, the short of it is yes, South Africa is IPv6 compliant, except it's through workarounds. Uh, yeah. Um, so the long answer is the ADSL network is not. Telcom's uh, IP Connect is, is IPv4 only. Even more importantly, though, is even if they were compliant, 80% um, of our routers out there aren't. Mm, mm. Um, and and uh, Graham mentioned that there are six RD routers available out there, and that's what you're going to need um, if you're going to be using uh, ISPs that use six RD technology. You're going to need a six RD router. If somebody uses something else, you're going to need a different router, I suppose. Well, I'm, I'm sure. Look, I know what the tunnels that I was using because you can do an IP4 tunnel. So you just yeah. Need a but I mean, but, well, what's cool about six RD is that it's plug and play, yeah. supposedly. Um, so this is what they said about plug and play uh, in the beginning of plug and play. Um, and yeah, so the idea behind this is you don't have to f fudge with um, IP tunnels and, and all kinds of you know funky stuff. You can just plug it in and get going. Look, we, we're going to do a more in-depth thing with this, though. Um, if you're worrying, don't. It's not going to happen any time. Yeah. Like I would say not at least for the next two years. Start playing now. Start working out what is going and where your problems will be. Having said that, uh, the world is not ready and it's not been deployed in enough places for Mm. The world is not ready for so, so one of the questions I did ask Graham, I'm not, I don't remember if I've put this in the article, in this particular article, I think I did. Uh, I asked him, is the internet sky really falling? And in those words. And he, he <laughs> said that in uh, Asia Pacific, they're actually already rationing IPv4 addresses. Um, and, uh, but my understanding is that this really comes down to an ineffective use of the IPv4 yeah. address space, which is, I mean, but from the sounds of it, it's just far easier to migrate to IPv6 than to try and get these addresses back and reuse them and reform them. I disagree. Okay, we'll no, I've just I've looked into it. Trust me, they're just going to yeah. get those. So um, to give to bring balance um, to this argument, uh, uh, Jean Baptiste from Android. I don't yes. remember his surname, his surname now, um, but he's in the Android Open Source. He's head of the Android yes. Open Source project. He actually is of the opinion that we're going to be using IPv4 through 2020, and um, that all the sky's falling talk has done is it's made IPv4 addresses more expensive. Um, I want to leave the discussion there because yeah. we're going to gonna... rant about this for half an hour yeah. another time. All right. Uh, next one is Google wins crucial API ruling. Oracle case. Decimated. Yeah, a word that I don't particularly like because, well, decimated doesn't really mean completely destroyed. Anyway, well, well that's a discussion for a, another day. Nowadays it does. Yeah, that's as enough. I say, discussion for another day. Uh, so, as we know, there has been a very long uh, legal case between Google and Oracle. This has been going since, I think, 2010. Um, Oracle said that Google infringed on their copyright when they used Java in Android. Uh, and they also asserted a couple of patents uh, and those things. What they, what, what it was going on about with the copyright though, wasn't that Google stole code. There, there was one mention of it, nine lines of code in a range check method, but the rest of it, they were arguing over the structure of the Java APIs that they used within Android. Whether you could copyright it or not. Whether you, yes, and, and we've that got needed to be decided. People in the IRC, um, I think. So can you can okay. give us that analogy um, that, yes, uh, that Google gave? The, the, Oh, yeah. oh, okay, with uh, language, okay. So um, an API is just an application programming interface, I, uh, I think. Yes, uh, I stand yes. to be yeah. corrected. Um, so that just gives you the, the path or the things that you need in order to build an application. It gives you the letters that you need to use in order to write something. Mm. So what Oracle is essentially saying is that you can copyright the letters in a language. You can copyright that language itself and not the book that you're writing, which is absurd at, on the face of it. Um, and the, uh, the federal judge has come back and he said that, in fact, the structure of Java APIs that Oracle is asserting cannot be copyrighted at all. Um, the code itself can be, um, but the, the, the how-to instructions of the APIs, those you can copyright. The structure, not at all. So Google has won fully in that. They were found guilty of the range check method and they did uh, violate one patent. But as the rumors go, uh, Oracle actually owes Google more money than what Google will need to pay Oracle for the marginal amounts of infringement that they are found guilty of. More importantly, though, if Oracle had won this, this would have just snowballed into them seeing a whole bunch of other people, yes. um, and then a whole bunch of other people starting to sue. It, 
you, you they, think they the would have falls are bad now? If this had been one, it would have been ten times worse. It so I'm would so have. I, I don't even want to think about what it would have done to the Java community, uh, and and just the Java language uh, as we know it at, well, at the moment. Well, never mind that. Think of all the other languages that people then start yes. asserting that it no, would they've it would have made for a very horrible precedent. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm quite glad it that is, yes, Google did It is a happy day for everyone. And, yeah. Right. Breathe a sigh of relief. So while we're on the topic of Android and Google, um, the x86 Asus Transformer, I think. Which is <coughs> technically not a transformer by, by name. But, but it's very similar. Yes, it's the same kind of um, form factor. Uh, this is a transformer. Um, I must say, if you, you read, read through the uh, special <laughs> article, it's, it's quite. It's <laughs> <laughs> in the movie, they go. It's, it's kind of like that. Kind of like that. <laughs> what, ha have you wanted a transformer with an x86? I can't remember what the second thing was. But the third was, and then running Windows. It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, yeah, x86 would be cool because it would be quite nice. You can then start running uh, a lot of your other programs that are recompiled on it. Uh, so I would love one with Android on it. Put Ubuntu with on it. With a dual boot, yeah, it would be great. Um, no problems with getting Ubuntu on there, yeah. hopefully. As far as I know, this also can separate all the rest of it. Yes, which um, is why we kind of call it a, an x86 transformer because it's the same form factor. It's a tablet, and you can dock it into a keyboard. So it's like the Asus transformer. Um, also touch sensitive, um, but is running Windows 8. So I have no, I don't have much interest in it. Yeah, unfortunately. And along with that, this is obviously being shown at Computex, and there are a variety of form factors being shown off that Windows 8. Uh, they're showing off Windows 8 on a whole bunch. You have things from just normal Ultrabooks. Uh, actually, no, they're not showing any kind of Ultrabooks. You have um, notebooks with touch-sensitive screens. You have larger notebooks with detachable screens, so transformer, but just bigger. You have all-in-one PCs, and I'm talking 18, 19-inch screens, and then you can undock it and take the screen with you. It's madness. I don't know how they imagine people will be using this in any kind well, of situation. Unless you're going to use it in a boardroom situation, so which you can Even do. And then you're carrying around. I mean, I'm thinking oh, more going back to when I had that 17-inch CRT monitor. It's the same thing that I'm carrying, carrying around. down. You might put it down flat on the table. And if it's touch, you can then have different people interacting yeah. and working with it. And I think also the workplace is, is, is changing. I think people aren't staying, you know, like with desktops and laptops. I know with me, I do a lot of business where I need my iPad or mm. my computer, but I need a bigger screen to design. I'm a designer, yeah. so what mm. I need, and, and I don't necessarily work in one office. So mm. maybe that's quite cool, is having a big, you know, big screen that I can then just pick up and transport. And yeah, it's still kind of heavy offices. and not it, quite as mobile as you'd like it to. That's why you have a laptop and an iPad and a screen. <laughs> is, and, and that's why <laughs> I like the, tron the, the slightly bigger transformer, like the, the laptops with detachable screens mm. that they have going. I think that's something that you can use, or uh, even the touch, uh, I don't know about the touch sensitive laptops that they have. Look, mm. screens, I must say, mm. screen technology has been stagnating for the past couple of years. Mm. There hasn't been much change. Yeah. So I'm glad. they're paying a lot of money. Yes. And now yeah. it's becoming. So I'm glad they're starting to change again because I'd like higher resolution, bigger screens again. Mm. Mm. Or to pay less for the ones I have now. <laughs> um, yeah. I, that would be bonus. So I'm glad that once again they're starting to finally look at this again. Mm. I think they stagnated quite a bit because of the 1080p and it was. They, 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 they finally found a standard that seemed to be working. Mm. Um, but if you're coding or, or doing design, better is always mm. and, and better. I wanted bigger to, is better. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to touch on that before we move on. Uh, from a design perspective, is a touch screen something that you would see yourself designing on in the future? Definitely. I mean, I've already started on you know the Wacom's. You've got you've already got you know the screens that you can now use the Wacom where you can see the screen on your actual okay. pad, and I've been using that. Um, and I think I think definitely I think also you know when it comes to doing natural you know strokes like paintbrush strokes and I think I think for design touchscreen. One question I have with it though they say is we are not designed to work like this. It's actually sure. very bad for us. So if yeah. you're sitting working up here all the time, so yeah. like all the designs that I see that actually work in real life, is that they'll they'll have maybe a bigger wacon or something in a wider area, but you're always working up there. Because your neck and stuff, yeah. but you're still but, working down here, so you effectively can rest your hand while while you're working. Yeah. But if you can, I mean, like in my head, I'm thinking of a piece of paper. Like if you're actually drawing or sketching, you're looking down here. Oh, that would work. Here. So if you had, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but now, but even with the Wacom, they they've now got them the big screen ones okay. that you can actually it is down like a piece of paper, and you can actually, and then it goes and it will send to, and it works off Photoshop, and then it goes straight to your your PC. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's incredible. No, no, I wish uh, I knew the model name. Yeah. <laughs> Technical stuff. <laughs> a thing that, that worried me about that is um, the touch screens. It's not like a piece of paper where you can rest your hand. 
yeah. on it and then draw because as you move, you're, you're busy touching the, the actual input. Um, it seems a lot more natural to me as opposed to like when I design, I sit and I, you know, with my, with my mouse. Um, let's talk, the, if I'm doing vector formats, you know, like you kind of got to, or if you're deep etching something, you kind of got to like take the mouse and do it. But when you've got a pen, and especially with Wacom, and I can imagine with being on screen, it's just so much easier to... One question with this, with, with the Wacoms, is it a, is a stylus that you use to draw with? Mm -hmm. or, or, or is it actually touch sensitive? So we'll pick up your hand movements. Stylus, but then also I do know that this Wacom does do touch finger, so you can use your finger as well. So there might be a different setting. Because normally with that, they do tend to detect large areas and think, okay, that's just you. Yeah, that's palm. Yeah. 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 Cool. I'll try and find I, I'm looking forward it. to it. No. I, I, I can't am. draw for anything, so I am. I'm, I'm <laughs> it's looking waste forward to it. I think it will change yeah. my life cool. incredibly. I, I can see it being quite nice because you could, could do so much more. So now you, you look. I still want the keyboard, but now you could have other things. So think of playing games with this instead. So instead of just uh, um, you can like create your own layouts of what must do. So when I hit shell, do this. The, the thing must do different things. And you, because it's a screen, you can effectively move it around and change it to what suits you. So I'm also thinking so much just for drawing, and just as a different input method would be awesome. Mm. Completely. Cool. Uh, next one, uh, linked in security and privacy issues. Yeah, Jan. so um, so what's happened today is LinkedIn didn't have a very good day today. No. Um, LinkedIn, first there was an issue on their, on their smart apps, and um, so what that was about is apparently they collect information from your calendar mm -hmm. and uh, they do it with permission but uh, they didn't explicitly state what they were doing with that data so they would take they would actually taking data from the calendar on your device and sending it back to linkedin and uh, and while they say they do request Ooh. access to your to your calendar it's never really explicitly stated that they're sending it back to the mothership um, and so they got into the, they got into some hot water today among uh, in the blogosphere, and and in the and in the mainstream tech media for that matter, um, for this. And and they've now since, um, you know, they've explained, and you know said you know that's what the legitimate reasons are. It's it's just unencrypted. Nobody can get to it. Um, you know that it helps with building intelligence into LinkedIn itself. Blah blah blah. So but once again, it's you taking my information without yeah. making me aware you're doing it. However, they have backtracked on one of the things they sent up. They actually scrape data from your meeting notes. So location sure. information, uh, dial-in details, PIN codes to get into the meetings. Um, that that data is all in that all in that section of the the calendar entry, and mm -hmm. they'd scrape yeah. that. And they said, okay, we won't scrape that anymore. Uh, and what about the the passwords, the hash yeah. passwords? So, so a Russian hacking group has claimed. Uh, well, the Russians, yeah. eh? The Russians. Always the Russians <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. They, they've claimed that they've swiped 6.5 million LinkedIn uh, passwords. They have been SHA-1 hashed. For the security guys out there, um, they have not been uh, salted. Not. No. no. There's point. Ah. Oh, damn it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so they can be... I Haven't mean, been what? Salted. <laughs> salted, yeah. It's, it's a way We'd to have make to explain it. Yeah, slightly uh, more secure. <laughs> just to, to do one, is um, basically with these things, what they do is it's a one-time conversion from your password into like a, a more random string that you can't convert back into. But what people out there go do is they create something called rainbow tables. And basically they make, they, they just generate, they go through all the possible character combinations and they create lots and lots of lookups for these. Yeah. So instead of having to work out and traverse engineer, they basically look up in this and they look up all the ones that they've pre-generated. Yeah. Okay. To stop this, what people do is they take your, your and what it is, if you change a single character in your, in your password, it ask gives you a totally day. different number. So what they do is they go and they append at the end of your password a normally a two character or three character string, which totally changes the hashes. And as long as they change these randomly, you can't then create lookups for it. Uh, more importantly, if nobody knows those, then there's no way they can create lookups for yeah. it. So if they haven't salted it, the security level has just gone down 
Tremendous. Horribly. But yes. that's something I've been wondering about forever. You know, like all of these um, applications asking you for your permission, asking you to do, like, and this, I mean, is this the first time that this kind of thing has actually come out in the open? No, no, no. no, no. Passwords have been stolen. Sony was, um, there have been a couple, but Sony was the last big one I remember. Yeah, they the, had a bad year. The whole, yeah, they had <laughs> a bad year. The whole Sony PlayStation Network's logins were stolen, um, including. Uh, credit card information, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but was up the little three-digit number yeah. at the back. So that, oh. that's it. But the rest was the rest was taken. Scary. Um, so it's happened to quite a couple of people. I know uh, I was doing a thing online with Reddit was one of the ones that also had all their passwords non-hashed stolen. Subsequently, they now hash them and do that. Yeah. Um, so I must say a lot of the sites have gotten a bit better. So let's if you go to Google and you give a guy rights to it, yeah. what they do is there's no password transfer there. Uh, they do like a bit of a key exchange um, and, and that key can be invalidated at any point. So if you go into Twitter, I'm sure you've seen the apps. Yeah. You yeah. can invalidate any, go, go check it because it's quite important to check every now and again. Yeah. Just because sometimes you add it and you've got it and then sometimes you go like, there's no way to want that. And as soon as you delete it, those people no longer have access to your data. They have the historic data, unfortunately, but from that point onwards, it's safe. Mm. Uh, Facebook yeah. is also quite, quite good with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that they're improving and it's getting there. But, but it, it does show you how, I mean, how we, we haven't really been taking online security seriously. Mm. Um, and taking it seriously is tedious. Uh, you're generating unique passwords for everything. The, and there are apps that help you with that. Uh, LastPass is a notable I example. I use that one quite a bit. Um, on pass, key pass as exactly. well. Exactly. There's a lots, of, of lots of ways to do this, but that's still a single point of failure. Mm. But at least that point of failure is under your control yeah. for the most part. Um, and with some of them, uh, LastPass does do syncing. Um, so I have LastPass on here, on my desktop, that sort of thing. But with others, they are completely local. Um, and you can then sync them over something like Dropbox if you want to, but yeah. you don't have to. Yeah. Uh, the point behind those password managers so having said say. that with LastPass, uh, they do not have any passwords and they can't unencrypt it. Yes. So th you type you in a password. password. Yes. Um, so yes, they send a file down to you, but you, in typing your password, you use that to unencrypt your, your passwords. So even if the DBs got hacked, you still yeah, safe. Yeah. Yes. So there are ways to, to, be, to be able to generate unique passwords for every single service that you sign up for. But until now, I mean, how many people do that? How many people don't just use a standard password? I'm still services? coming across services that I use that LinkedIn was one of them that used one of my standard passwords. Same problem, so I changed my password. Yeah, it yeah. changed today. <laughs> But I heard, I mean, I heard, I mean, I don't know if, if you went over, but like they said, the best way to do it is if you if you have a password and you just change, you know, one or two small things, but either to a one or a zero. Not anymore. Or a, a really. No. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting the, the wrong the, information. The current best, <laughs> there's two things, I think, is rather generate a long password and write it down, because they found out, actually, in fact, that's more secure. It's because it's, what well, more <laughs> in the sense, that. What, what's As the chance that somebody's going to break into your house? compared to somebody who's going to break into your PC. So, yes. so you uh, mean that the document that I've got saved on my desktop called pass count. Passwords is not no. a good thing? <laughs> no, not, not, not a good idea. Okay. Uh, <laughs> pen and paper is better. Okay. Um, Unless you're some sort of activist or you know something that the government wants to get at, uh, then, <laughs> then, then you might want to find another way than a piece of paper. Yes. But, yeah. but for the average well, no, no. have a piece of paper with invalid passwords. <laughs> um, then the next one is to roll the crash sentences. So rather create like three or four words. But it has to be sort of random. It can't yeah. be sensible. Um, so what was XKCD's example? Um, horse, fence, something, something. I don't know. Like, I, I got that horribly wrong. But yeah. uh, something, four, four words, unrelated, chain them together. Yeah. yeah. And even if you do chain them together, it's still more secure than a, than a short, shorter password. Mm. Uh, it's just not as secure as those individual letters together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm still surprised that some of these companies don't. But I know we, we I know of another company that, that basically they had gone through a weak hashing algorithm, but now they couldn't unhash it. So to actually go to the more secure one, and it was just too much effort to go, go and do that. So yes, one day. <laughs> <laughs> and now to something just pretty awesome, 3D printers we've spoken about. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. We've got one. Yes, ah, sorry. <laughs> Fedora yes. could potentially, well, no, they've, they've said that this is the solution. Uh, it's not the best solution, but it's the one they've decided on. What I'm talking about is um, for secure boot, Microsoft uh, Windows 8 will require secure boot on all, um, all PCs certified for Windows 8. 
which means that for the, the hackers out there and for those people who prefer a different operating system, something like Ubuntu or Fedora, so, so basically something you, you like can't that. can't run Windows 8 on most current hardware. No, you can. You can. But, but on new hardware. All new hardware that is, micro, that is Windows 8 certified will have Secure Boot enabled by default. And OEMs have been told that they need to uh, have an option in there to disable it, um, stuff like that, you know, so that you can actually get other operating systems yeah. on there. Um, but of course, that's kind of tedious. And then you're also disabling Secure Boot, which is not the ideal solution, because it is actually uh, a very useful solution to a very big problem. Yes. Um, so what Fedora has decided on doing is they're going to shell out money to, uh, was it very sign? No, uh, it's not Microsoft, but they're going to shell out the $99 uh, and make their own key so that they can actually sign, sign. Sign, sign their code and so that you can boot Fedora. But you still have to sort of preload it at that point. Or, or how does this work? Is, do you no, no, you're, uh, it's, it's just their bootloader that needs to be signed. So they have a, okay. a, a very minimal uh, bootloader, which then goes from there. But everything past that still has to be signed as well. But they can sign those with different keys. Okay. So it's just that initial bit that needs to be signed with a third party key. Uh, and I'll, I'll get it now uh, who the signing authority is. Uh, it is very signed. Um, so it needs to be signed by them. And uh, from there, you can still get it, but they have to sign the entire stack up until you actually boot it up, because otherwise they're still leaving holes in the system so that you can still hack Windows. But they've decided to, sh to shell out the $99 no, look, um, and, and pay for this. Well, some of these things, I, I can Secure Boot is actually pretty cool. My, my main problem with it was that you, you couldn't then, the initial proposal was you couldn't invalidate it. So the only software you could ever run on that was Windows. Or somebody and, who implements Secure Boot, surely. Yes, or something. But you still need them to have put the keys in or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you still need some validation. And, and that was a bit anti with it. You want to be able to lock it. So let's say at some point, two years down the way, I'm sick of Windows, I want to put Linux on and throw it as a server. Now you can't. So you're basically taking a whole bunch of software and hardware out of the, the stream that could be used for other software. Um, but in this, even with Linux, it'd be nice to sometimes use these, uh, there's the encryption where you can store your keys and thing. And more, if you've got a server that you want to encrypt, so if you know, somebody takes your server and they start taking the devices out of that, that it won't boot anymore. So there are actually even in the open source world valid users for it. Mm -hmm. All right, now we can go to your favorite topic. Yes. <laughs> 3D printers uh, as art. Um, and basically, this, if, if you look around, you, you've got all the 3D printers that uh, are now becoming more and more viable. And I, I was at the House for Hack the other day, and they printed out some claws, which is awesome. And we use it with our Arduino project, which, which made it even better. Uh, and it's just amazing what you can do. And it was just something he just literally lifted off the internet and printed uh, within half an hour. Uh, now, what people are also starting to do this is they're now starting to use this to create art. So they're starting to create art that in no way would you ever be able to carve something this way or do it. And it's incredibly beautiful and amazing. Um, and it just starts to show the things that as time goes by and people can do thought experiments where it gets built up over time of the things that you can create. Um, even I know there's a, a uh, what's it called? I don't know. What's it called? A uh, site where you, you get funding for projects? Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Kickstarter project. There you go. Uh, where you can get a MakerBot now for about 5,000 Rand. No. So it's quite a small one. Rand. But I'm like tempted. I think um, you should. I think I think I would love I would love to give it a try. If you bought one, I would definitely. It's, well, it's yeah. worthwhile. Uh, look, I don't know where you're going to get the pieces. And, and they've got different scales. You can go this way. We're not going to give you the, we're going to give you the pieces, but not the nuts and bolts. You've got to go buy the nuts and bolts. And then the next one up is we'll give you the nuts and bolts, but you've got to go buy the motors as well. Uh, and scales with the five grand one, I think it was with postage and packaging, and it's everything. And then they had another one which was even bigger, so you can print bigger things. But like a little home one for printing stuff, five grand, it's 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 there. It's, it's almost worthy. like a good yes. Wait another year, another year, two years, everyone will have one in the home. Yeah? <laughs> Look, it's coming. It's gonna printed. it's gonna come. Can you imagine school project. School projects are gonna be amazing. Yes. Hey? Look, I, I can't even imagine uh, <laughs> showing my age a school project with the internet must have been so much easier. <laughs> you have no idea. I know. I used to, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not even that old, but I still use the encyclopedias. Yes, exactly. And, you, and you're cutting out pictures out of the high school. Exactly. Experience. Or I can like, remember in, in sort of late, you know, high school area, the encyclopedia on the on the DVDs and mm, CDs. And Carta was one. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that suddenly made life so much easier. So now this, and you can print. 
but never mind like that. Just think you've got to do any anatomy stuff in school for the teachers to print out the different but pieces. But I think they have actually been using 3D printers for. I think doctors have been using it. Yeah, no, to they do definitely things. have. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when they've got to do surgery, so they, they get the MRI to get the 3D scan, and then they print that, so they can actually start to work out how they're going to get in and where they're going to cut and stuff, and it has a huge improvement. It's incredible. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I don't know if you'll get one, but I want to. <laughs> one day, I'll, one day I'll, I'll have I'll, it on the Christmas list. I'll go yes. Harvey's. <laughs> <laughs> um, from that into something far more South African, Interwebs Radio. Interweb. Inter Welcome interwebs. to Interwebs. Streaming radio. <laughs> yeah. Jan. So, yeah, these, these are the same guys uh, behind Vat Cake Yay. Um, Good folk Lekker. there. Yeah, so <laughs> for those of you who don't know Vat Cake Yay, it is not for sensitive readers. <laughs> Um, but so, it is hilarious. But it is hilarious nonetheless. So um, this is actually a completely different project. So even though my first experiences with Interwebs Radio was them doing like an album launch for the Antwoord. Um, and for those who know about the Antwoord and uh, their relationship with Vat KK will know that, you know, the, that they are fairly interlinked. Mm. Um, and so I kind of associated Interwebs Radio with that. But um, now they, they recently got approved to be in the iTunes store. And uh, uh, to, to rag on them a little, their press release claimed that they were the first. But uh, we very quickly were informed that, in fact, there are other South African streaming, or at least streaming radio stations run by South Africans, because almost none of them None of them I could find stream actually stream out of South Africa. And all, they're Interweb all, Radio does? No. They all actually stream, uh, Interweb Radio streams out of Germany mm -hmm. and others stream out of the US. Um, so Is it just too expensive? Yeah. They, yeah, they say that. Uh, uh, but, I mean, Who I did. said that? If you use. I asked them how Airwave. much bandwidth they use and they, and they gave me a four month breakdown. And I think the highest they went was about 400 gigs. Um, you know, pushing, pushing bandwidth. Mm. Um, a total being optimistic. Yeah. Uh, four months. One month. No, you could do that or find ways anyway, yeah. I think they're trying to be a little more scalable than that because they do play South African music, stuff from Johannes Kerk Oral uh, through to I think they had Jevels Fantastis to the Antwoord um, and some o other more conventional South African rock stuff. But that's um, awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. yeah. Uh, they play that, but they also then they would in a heartbeat switch to Death Cab for Cutie and uh, Florence and the Machine. This is like an eclectic music lovers. Dream. It's it's really really cool to see this Amazing. coming from a from a South African from a South African startup. So, um, and they said that they are a startup. Their their aim is to actually turn this into a functioning business. That's amazing, and that's the thing. I think um, also like music in South Africa at the moment, there isn't anyone. I mean, to get onto the radio stations, you really have to either know someone, or it has to be kind It'll of be like brilliant. popular. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but I think that there are a lot of you know local talent, and I think startups like that are very much needed, mm. especially in the entertainment. Because, I mean, it's, 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 music in South Africa is growing. It's dying. Well, I don't know about that. There know. are a lot of uh, a lot of good South African bands But I'm talking about them, the, them getting paid them just, yeah, enough yes. and, get, and getting, and getting that, that's almost. I, wonder, I almost want to say it's never been the case yeah. that they've been able to just live off of yeah. making music. They've yeah. always, like, all the bands I followed when I was at Varsity, they were software engineers or yeah. code monkeys or... You know, all of them had a nine Still to five. Still had another or, job, yeah. Were, you know, at best they were students, so they had some free time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, really yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it, it is a it is a challenge, I think, still mm. for South African musos to make enough money off of their art to live. What mm. I find this more exciting about this is we're finally starting to get far more internet technologies Digital. and internet companies coming out and mm. doing things like this. If you look overseas, how many are there? Mm -hmm. You know, in this country there's none because of our bandwidth. And it just means mm -hmm. there's enough people in this country finding something to get the bandwidth to start making these viable and that there are people listening. It. Look, imagine a large percentage of the people are still overseas in London and Australia, the old South Africans listening to these things. But I would imagine they must have also quite a, a following in South Africa. And it mm -hmm. means it's great, which is good. Mm -hmm. And the more you have this, the more people you get, the more you have this. Mm -hmm. And eventually you, that one feeds off the other. And the interesting thing is, I think, is that, you know, um, music is turning digital as mm -hmm. well. So it's quite interesting that, you know, interwebs, radio, like how it could actually fit into the digital world, like I think they could do interesting stuff mm. with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and, and they've, I mean, they, they've got this awesome Zef uh, vibe going for them. So they I can love the logo. Yeah, they can the basically logo is so do cool. anything 
uh, and no one would it. be surprised. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and they'd be like, oh yeah, I expected that of Interwebs Radio. Um, uh, so other cool things that they're doing co competing with us a little bit uh, is they say that they're going to be live streaming events um, and they're going to do sort of recurring uh, recurring broadcasts of live events. So often on a Friday, I'd find myself listening to an album launch that they recorded at uh, a venue somewhere, either in Pretoria or in Johannesburg. Cool. So, um, and they said that they, they built their infrastructure like, like that from the ground up. Um, so yeah, it's actually very cool to see them gearing themselves for a couple of different things. They say they're looking at getting DJs in, uh, but they've got this cool ad running where they, what they say, their, ad, their, their DJs don't uh, write books or, uh, or opine on anything, <laughs> taking a direct stab at, <laughs> at, cer at certain 5FM DJs. So, you know, they play music. So that'll be the thing. If they've got DJs on, they won't be there to yap at you and talk your ear off like we are. They well, will my be question with that music. is why don't they just then use a playlist? They do use a playlist currently. No, but what I mean is I could just get Spotify and have a playlist. Yeah, I guess. Except, can you get Spotify So, so well, we, we will eventually have something of the equivalent in this country. It's just the way it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always find that you want the DJ, so one, it's curated, so that is good that they're exactly. curating. People but, want curated content. And so. I want, but I also want some feedback. I want, you know, to know a bit more about the music I'm listening to. Yeah. So I want some speaking. In. However, when I'm so working... So you want community, yeah. Well, Carry on. <laughs> you want, you want, but I think also this, in this day and age, like everything's about communication. You want to discuss things. You want to talk about things. Well, uh, yeah, I want to hear that. But if, if I don't, then I'm going to not listen to an online where I don't have a choice of what's going to play next. Mm. If, I, if I'm giving up that choice, I, I want to gain something back for it. Yeah. Um, and that would be somebody on the other side who knows what they're doing um, or, and talking about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And kind of like enlightening you, and it's like or when, 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 when you when you discover something, sometimes making it interesting is yeah. maybe a better way. So yeah. on interwebs, they might not be talking about the music, but we're talking something utterly random, but that's interesting. So yeah. it's just it's effectively making this, the stream interesting, uh, and that's what I want when I, when I'm listening to something like that. Fair enough. I, I don't know if I'm different in that. I know when I'm working, I don't want somebody talking; it distracts me. But yes. then, then I'm going to listen to my playlist. Yeah, but what's cool about it is I don't have to. Put a, I don't have to curate the playlist now. I can just double click on Interwebs Radio. And on occasion, there's a funny ad, you know, like an old Rembrandt Front Rain ad. Or so it's more like a, like a lucky packet. It's kind of, that's exactly <laughs> what it seems like a lucky packet radio station, which I think is quite cool as well. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, there is that. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll go into our last one for tonight. <laughs> into which, the one you've all been waiting from for. something r r rather <laughs> random, as we're saying, something. To utterly random. Um, <laughs> the cat copter. The cat copter. Uh, that um, is disturbing. Very disturbing. More because it's from a real cat. Uh, one of them unfortunately had uh, the cat run over by a car. Oh, wow. Shame. So they so took it to a start weeping on the show. And they basically <laughs> rebuilt it into a cat quadrocopter. Gentlemen, we have the money. We can rebuild it. <laughs> um, we can make it better. <laughs> and, it, and it actually works because there's actually a video where they, they, they're flying it. And I must say, if you suddenly saw this thing coming at you, it is so random. Dive bombing cat. It's No. Uh, uh, you do wonder what, what, what they thought about, why they thought about it all. Um, well, I'm assuming the guy is pretty attached to his cat. Shame. And now I can take it out and play with it if you can. Exactly. Make my, my, my cat into a hat one day. Yeah, but then you can keep them. But I mean it with love. I don't know if I'd actually make him into a hat. Do you know what I mean? That would be exactly. disturbing. Or I'd tell him he might be. Or if you did, you wouldn't mat. tell us. I'd say you'd make a good mat, my cat, or a hat. But then and I don't know if I'd actually do it. The, what, the would cat I, in the hat. I, would I be able to wear the hat? I don't know. Would I be able to make it into a heli helicopter? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a cat um, copter. I, th I think in this country you might. Be frowned upon. Yeah, no, stuff. SPCA might arrive. But in a way, it's also pretty cool. Uh, and with that, um, Jan Vermeulen, where can we find you? I am a staff writer at my broadband, so I spend most of my online time there. Um, my broadband at ZZA. Uh, occasionally, I'm on Twitter at Jan VZA, and I'm on Google Plus, Jan Vermeulen. You can click on the one with the ugly face and circle him, and uh, that'll be me. Cool. 
Indiana Harris. Sure, where can lots, lots of places. Okay, nice find underscore indie for Twitter. Um, I do many a thing. I'm a social media manager as well. I have a company called Streets and Stages. Cool. You can also chat to me on Twitter at Streets and Stages. Um, I also do a little vintage shop in Melville and I run an online shop and that's called Nice Find. That's why Nice Find Indie. Um, www.nicefind.co.za, which is still under construction, but it shall get there. Um, yeah, that's that, that's me so far. I could give LinkedIn and I could be deep, but we'll be here forever. So. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I also know you are somehow involved with Mindset. Yes, yes. Um, I am the community manager for the Mindset Learn Facebook page. So I'm a social media manager. We started off with 400 learners on the page, and now we've got over 11,000. Yeah, 11,000. Over 9,000. <laughs> over 11,000. <000. laughs> exactly. So yeah, over a year, um, we've managed to actually build the, the community of um, learners throughout South Africa that have been interacting on the page on their self phones which is incredible and actually send them um, I sit and I send them educational resources material which is free that they can then download onto their cell phones um, read I mean even even and I do live shows as well I do the presenting sometimes cool. like I did tonight I've already been on live TV for three hours this evening um, so, so I chat to them up. <laughs> All warmed up and slightly half asleep <laughs> 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 but good yeah so doing a lot um, Quick thing about me, I love communication, I love online, but I love the I love the conversation of online. So maybe I might not be a bit as as, as technical as you guys, but I like I like the conversation and I like talking to people in their spaces. And that's where I'm hoping streets and stages is gonna be moving, but more towards NGOs, NPOs, um, causes. I I like talking about things that matter and that make a difference. So that's where my little company, Streets and Stages, is going. So awesome. watch the space. We will. It's still a baby company, but it's getting <laughs> there. The third start that way. Yeah, cool. Exactly. You've got to uh, start somewhere, right? Can, can we ask some questions? I'm stopping sure, your outro. No, like go for it. In its tracks no, we there. have some time. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually early for once. Are we? <laughs> Lies. <laughs> I don't believe you, you. you have four minutes. OK, cool. Um, so uh, in, in your sort of social media management stuff that you do yeah. uh, is it mainly just building the community or um, do you handle the communication into that community I that community? do everything my background is I was an advertising art director designer and I remember working on a project where we did this big thing for um, for someone to go to, to do their Facebook and what I did you know I did all the artwork we helped them with the tabs mm -hmm. and at the end they couldn't carry on the conversation so that's what I kind of that's where it started and then with mindset learn you know we came and there was no one talking and there were 400 people so at the beginning it was you know doing artwork up, updating doing tabs um, starting a conversation but now I mean as the community has gotten bigger I literally do I do everything from moderation to um, new artwork to build I build the tabs myself but then I used I don't I use third party apps so I use we all do yeah <laughs> no why trust me I don't why, build my own why apps. write your own thing when somebody else has done it <laughs> why reinvent it's, it's, it's when no. you are writing your own thing why write your own code when you can copy paste <laughs> yes uh, no, no. no. <laughs> get out, Indiana, get out. Trust me, if, if, if we can find something that makes our lives, you just realize there's just so much work to do. Exactly. And there's so many hours in the day. And there's so many people doing, you know, in terms of like the social media space, it just moves too fast. Every day, like one day something works, the next day it doesn't work. Mm. So I constantly am learning how to, you know, work with the platform and how to evolve and also how to learn what the mindset learn community needs in terms of strategy because that's what I'm I also I do online strategy as well and what the interesting thing with mindset learn is that it's a completely it's its own kind of creature um, we are we are able to actually start educating um, learners out there that don't have access to you know like the good good schools good teachers you know teachers that come in you know um, we have and, and they're starting to help each other. It's become an organic community. Like when we post questions, they actually start to help each other out. Because we, it's also a 48 hour help desk where we've got people man behind that answer the questions. 48 hour? 
help desk. How does that, what do you mean 48 hour? So what they can do is they As can come onto the 24 page. 24 hour. 40, 24 hour would be hectic, 11,000 people on the page. We try our best. So what they do is if they've got a question in maths. Okay, sorry, and let's just get 48 hours from when the video. They post. Oh, yes, I was gonna say, not 48 hours post. a day. Okay. No. That's too much. That's too much. I was gonna say, I wish I had you, you have 40, two people working. So it's 48 hour turnaround time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. I wish I had a 48 hour work day, but I don't, <laughs> unfortunately. Unfortunately. Um, at the moment, I'm juggling tons of stuff, but I think I'm very excited to see where social media is going, but for for change. And I think, I mean, even Causecast um, is, I mean, Causecast is an amazing, this is actually a whole show in its own, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, I, I'm interested in sustainability. I'm interested in, up, in community upliftment, community projects, and how the social media space can actually start to work um, with actual real communities and how you can actually take it into a digital world and then actually bring bring communities together online. Um, cool. Okay, good question. Yeah. Sorry, what's an NPO? <laughs> Non-profit organization. Oh, okay, so I should like NGO. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's just, once again, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's tech, yeah. technology no, no, yeah. that we don't See, use. Yes, <laughs> finally, something they didn't know. <laughs> um, and how do you, Maybe a short question, but but maybe a complicated one. How do you handle trolls? Oh, do you know what? The most amazing thing is that on Mindset Learn, even though we've got 11,000 learners, oh, and by the way, actively every day, about 1,800. Um, and how I handle trolls is it's the most amazing thing. We don't really get any. If we do, what will happen, either the mindsetters, that's what we call them, or the learners will kind of be like, listen, guy, don't bring your negative attitude here. And if I do, I mean, obviously I say, you know, no swearing, please don't post your your, your email addresses or your telephone numbers and don't add anyone funny. So I, I think privacy is one of the biggest things that I probably struggle with and I'm trying to educate them. But trolls, you know, it's, it's a learning, Sorry, it's a learning I, I've space. just been uh, told we need to finish. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, sorry. I talk a lot. Yeah. Where, where can we find you? About.me slash HawkeyZA. You'll find everything there. Cool. And you can find me mostly on wiki.listalknetwork.tv. I will be there somewhere. Cool. And with that, enjoy your week. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for inviting me, guys. Cool. Pleasure. <laughs>